Okay, we can go ahead, I'll go and get started. I'll do a brief introduction and then we'll be rolling with it. So um, welcome everybody um, to our bi-monthly uh, CWDL, uh, See What's Possible webinar series. Um, in these series, in these webinars, we try to bring in experts in the industry that can talk things other than accounting for us and um, talk through stuff that's happening in the industry, key hot issues, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, today, we're very excited to have our friends um, at MCT on the line um, with us. We got, we're going to cover today, what we're going to cover is we're going to kind of cover a, a dual topic here. We're going to cover both both the, the execution side of things and what happened, you know, kind of in March and April and May and what what, what the, you know, what, what, we, what we're looking forward to in, you know, the, the coming months. Um, and then we also have, we're also going to talk about the MSR side of things as well and what, what happened to valuations, how, how's trading working on the MSR side and just, just what's happening over, I mean, you know, February and March were, you know, different months than what we were used to, you know, last year and whatnot. So I thought it was a timely time to bring MCT in and, and talk about that. So with that, um, we've got Andrew Rhodes um, is our is our first presenter here on this on this webinar. Um, Andrew began his career with MCT in 2005 as the company's first dedicated loan sales specialist. Uh, he initially created investor specific models to accurately produce market based mandatory pricing for all pricing aspects in MCT, including rate sheet generation, best execution, and fair market valuations. Um, during the during the years following his hire, his role was redefined to include client pipeline risk management. And then over the years, he's been able to grow with the company, gaining skills and experience in multiple fields and secretary. He was soon after named the SVP of trading. And as part of his daily operations, he's been responsible for overseeing the risk management and loan sale execution for many of MCT's clients. Outside of his daily operations, Mr. Rhodes has been instrumental in helping the role of MCT's lives band platform, among many other new initiatives at MCT. So Andrew's going to cover obviously the execution side, what's what was happening in trades, what's happening in you know pipeline valuation stuff like that. And then second, we have David Burris from MCT. So David Burris is the MCC, MCT's MSR sales director. He has uh, 30 years of uh, mortgage industry experience. Um, as the director of MC, MSR sales, David is responsible for marketing outreach and acquisition of new customers. Previously, Mr. Burris worked in the subservicing and MSR world, uncovering private label clients and those who wanted to sell MSRs. He ran his own concert, consulting firm, offering a broad range of services like business product, business and product development, investor relations, recruiting, and outsourcing. Uh, David also has a rich legacy in the national accounts arena, servicing many of the top 20 US lenders for PMI Mortgage Insurance Company, ArchMI, and Freddie Mac. In, in this role, he has covered the entire mortgage manufacturing process from origination through foreclosure, creating products and services focused on generating efficiencies and uncovering profitable niches for his customers. He's also led several teams who have developed some of the first automated underwriting processes in the industry. Um, so with that, and then our, our last one, obviously, is, you know, Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson's the managing partner of CWDL. Uh, you know, he's been around the industry for a while. He's not only does he run the firm and get guides the vision of the firm, he also used to own a mortgage company and um, was the CFO of a couple others. So he, he brings a client side perspective to this. Um, he's going to be moderating our panel today. So with that, I think I'll turn it over. I think that's all I had. I'll turn it over to Mark to, to kick it off. Yeah, thanks, Dustin. Um, and, and thanks again, the, the, our, our friends over at MCT, we always um, are, are super, super excited to have you guys join us and, and, and chime in here. Um, you guys really on the front line in some of these topics. And so we really appreciate that. Obviously, Dustin, for you guys don't know, he's a, he's a, a mortgage banking partner in the practice and helps um, oversee the overall uh, mortgage banking practice. So um, why don't we jump into it? Um, at, and and kind of and kind of dig in. The idea here is that we do these webinars to help our our clients and um, industry people have some of some of the the information they need to make really great decisions. So, um, thanks again for being here. So, let's start off. What happened in March and uh, part of February? What what was going on? Um, maybe give us a a high view of, of what was what what happened. I know. Um, our phones were ringing off the hook and, and clients were trying to get, get an understanding of what's happening. Maybe um, from your perspective, why don't you go ahead and share with us a little bit what you were seeing and, and what happened? Oh, you're on mute, Andrew. Yeah. There we go. 
Yeah. Sorry. That's I'm all right. Out. You're getting used to this. Um, yeah. No, no, definitely, definitely appreciate you guys having me on, um, you know, to talk to the talk to the group about this. And yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of a, a not to say a calamity of all events, but it, I mean, it is definitely, there's a, a couple things going on that caused some um, disruptions in the to be announced mortgage backed security market, you know, which leads into the uh, end all be all pricing for your loans and execution. So uh, in, I, I think it was, you know, earlier in the year, the, the Fed kind of dictated that they were going to be moving away from certain coupons, uh, you know, with their purchase schedule. So they came out and, you know, they let us know that, you know, they're not, not they're not going to be buying one and a half coupon anymore. So that I think led to some disruption. And then, you know, I think some people read into that, like, oh, hey, now the Fed's going to pull out of buying mortgage backed securities. So there was a lot of, uh, kind of confusion um, around uh, their purchases. So that led to some disruptions in the market. And, you know, uh, along with that, you know, we had guidance from um, from the FHFA that, you know, hey, now we're going to start reducing cash window executions to $1.5 billion over a four-quarter period, uh, as well as, you know, hey, now seconds and non-owners are, are going to be uh, capped out at 7% on a lender, lender basis. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that came out. You know, we did a, we did a webinar back on, uh, back in February to kind of go over some of those, um, differences and, you know, what could potentially be causing the execution differences. And, and I think just from a high level, I mean, we saw pricing on the Fannie two go from, I think we were over, yeah, we were over one Oh three, uh, back in the middle of February and currently, or I guess it went down to uh, 90, the low 99s uh, in the middle of March. So, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big, big drop, right? So, so a four point drop, you know, definitely it perked some people's uh, interest and, you know, raised concerns because it's like, Hey, is, you know, how's my, how's my loan profitability tracking to my, to my hedge, right? And do those match up and what kind of inconsistencies are we going to see? So what we, I mean, currently what we're, we're, we're talking to clients about is um, looking back over a three month period, which we usually find is a good metric for profitability saying, Hey, you know, if you're looking back over a three month period, then you're usually going to see the, you know, profitability it's in a, it's in a, it's in a mellow out a lot more than looking at the open pipeline or, you know, looking at it one month over one month. But what we're, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing some of the profitable trades uh, fall off of that three month window. Um, and, but you're, you're still, you, you haven't sold the loans yet at that point in time. So you're taking the profit, uh, you know, from uh, uh, an accrual basis, you're ta taking the profit from those trades back in February and March and now all of a sudden you're selling loans, you know, at the end of March and in April uh, that are negative. So you're having a, a negative impact from the loan sales affect that three month profitability window. So um, I, I think, you know, just being aware of kind of all the different moving pieces is, is necessary in terms of um, looking at it from from a profitability perspective. Right. So uh, a couple, you know, all those different things with now higher rates, lower production, so, you know, one thing that I think, um, one thing that I, that I have a common conversation about with our clients and, um, you know, the, the accounting team is, you know, making 300 basis points on 200 million um, is, is not the same as making 300 basis points on 100 million. So there's, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge drop with the, the revenue that comes in house based off of that production drop. So even if your secondary marketing team is, you know, hitting their, hitting their goal of 300 basis points, you're still going to see a drop off in overall revenue based off of the production. So uh, it's silly. <laughs> I think yeah, it's silly to say, right. But, but I mean, it, it, it's a common point that we need to keep addressing. Well, well, I think, I think, you know, as we see in, the, in our practice and Dustin can jump in here, you know, one of the biggest influences of your bottom line is, is the fair value of your open pipeline. So those locks. So to your point, if you end a particular month with a $300 million pipeline, that's locked and not funded. And then the next month you end with $150 million of locked pipeline. 
essentially you have $150 million of value related to that pipeline drop off, although you may have funded more loans than you ever funded in that particular month. And so your, your bottom line P&L looks a little bit off. It doesn't feel right. And that looking at that three month window really helps explain that story or even four months to kind of see how that the noise and the and the P&L kind of um, fluctuates. Um, Dustin, yeah, and Andrew, you can talk through that a little bit. I know we had some calls in Q1 and, and post Q1 about that. Yeah. And, and Andrew, what we, and, and, you know, direct me here if I'm doing something wrong, but I mean, what we treat, you typically try to do is we try to isolate it down to basis points too, is we'll try to like, then we try to that way it isolates out the you know the, the the move in production. So we'll you know we'll take you know whatever those fair value marks are at the end of the month, and you know especially there at you know the end of March and end of April reporting and show yeah like you, you know here here's what here's what happened in basis points. But like if you look at the you know the trade side of thing that you were talking about, I mean we, we had you know your, your value of your pipeline may have you know dropped off some, but your trades all of a sudden flipped to an asset, which I don't think you know a lot of you know, accounting departments are, are used to that over the last year of having this asset. I mean, we actually saw a lot of people book it backwards to tell you the truth because right. they weren't used to it being an asset. I mean, they, they you know, they're taking a hit on both sides. And we're like, wait, wait a second. This is actually an asset this month. So, uh, you know, you need to flip that sign and get to get that there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that was, I mean, but overall, Andrew, I mean, that doesn't mean, you know, at the end of Q1, our clients were losing a lot of money or anything, right? I mean, they were making it up and yeah. Yeah, no, 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 to totally. It's yeah. I think none of none of our clients were were losing money per se, but it was just more of um, you know more of a of a, a shift, like you were saying, you know, in a different way of viewing it. And yeah, oh, going over the the last year, you know, um, it's it's always been a cost, right? The the the, the hedge side or the TBA side, um, the offsetting position to the loan side has always been a cost. Um, but it, it's interesting to to kind of. To, to step into this new space and kind of see the profitability um, on, on the trade position shift to, to more of a, now that now clients can really see it as a teeter totter effect instead of, you know, seeing it as, Oh, it's always one sided. Right. Um, so, so I think, you know, over, over, over the, you know, I guess 18 month window that we're looking at here um, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting to see that shift. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, and then kind of just to just to touch on, uh, I don't want to take up you know take up everybody's time, but just to touch on uh, the, uh, the 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 value, the fair value of the of the open pipeline. I think one thing um, you know that I continually say to my clients as well is that um, there's a lot of investors out in the market that aren't. I guess let me phrase this a different way. There's a lot of investors in the market right now that are buying on a bulk basis. So if you're selling all of your production to invest to aggregator investors on a on a bulk basis, um, you know that's the that's going to get you the most profitability, right? That's going to get you the best price for that loan. However, from a fair market fair market accounting perspective, those investors aren't always providing bulk execution bids on your March market for a fair value. So the, the, the March market reports that come out, you know, could be or, or are going to be conservative in the fact that, you know, they're not marking it to the true value of that bulk pickup. So, you know, this is a, a drum that, you know, uh, my boss, Phil Rosori, has always been, he's been beating for, you know, the last four or five years is trying to get more investors to provide that bulk execution for mark to market valuations. Um, so we've done a, you know, we've done a, a fairly decent job with getting that aggregator execution, um, bulk execution into the month end March markets. Um, but providing it on a daily basis is just, it's something that the uh, investors are finding difficulty with. But I think, you know, I think that all changes as we move into kind of a more uh, streamlined bid process, you know, so I, I think that isn't a change in the future, but it's just uh, something Something to remember if you're, you know, for, for the accounting guys, if they're looking at this um, report day over day, you know, there, there could be big, big jumps in value change just based off of that bulk execution being included or not being included. So out of curiosity, how much is the bulk like execution pickup? Like, if, if you, I mean, if you had to give just an average, I mean, I know it's not going to be exact every time, but what, you know, just on average, what? 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, I mean, that's a great question. And it's something that all of our clients ask. And I mean, the fact of the matter is it's, um, it changes. It, it, it's not, I can't say, you know, consistently it's going to be 30 basis points because, uh, you know, for a client that only has two or three bulk investors, it could be, you know, 10 basis points. But for a client who has, you know, let's call it 20 different bulk investors, it could be, you know, 30 basis points. So it's, it really does range depending on, uh, depending on the investor outlets. So I think that's the, that's the tough thing to gauge. And, you know, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, it's trying to get more investors to adopt uh, technology so they can start providing. Uh, so it's not as much of a resource load on them to provide, uh, you know, uh, bulk valuations for, for mark to market purposes. Got it. Got it. Okay. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention, go back real quick to housekeeping, just in case I, I didn't mention this is if we had any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and a, as we go through, we'll, we'll answer them as we're going through. And if we don't get to them at the end, we will answer them at the end or, or subsequently. So sorry, I didn't mean to break up the rhythm there. I just wanted to make that known to people. So, um, so yeah. So. Yeah. I guess from, kind of talk staying on this topic a little bit of what happened um did did pull through rates change um as a result of some of some of the movements in the market I, I know um i know we talked a little bit about that and then and then we talked about all the various things that affected the uh the actual margins maybe we can kind of narrow it down a little bit on those two topics like how did this how did, how, how was that affected um in the early part of this year yeah, no, I mean that's a it's, a, it's another good point, uh, uh, Mark. The the pull through actually, you know, for the clients that I've reviewed, um, just going back, you know, from you know, let's look at it from like a Q1 uh, Q1 basis, is actually pretty pretty similar to what their overall historical pull through was doing. You know, going back to you know 2020, even 2019. Um, so, so we didn't really, I didn't really see any outliers um, with the with it. Uh, change in pull through. Um, I mean, you would think like you would think that during a market deterioration like we saw between February and March, that you'd have uh, an increase in pull through. And I think you know what we saw, what we've seen is that the historical pull through is kind of in line with what we were expecting. Um, in, in terms of margin, that's kind of the more interesting piece that I that I've been seeing here is that. You would you would think that with increased volatility that the margin was actually widened out between a, a long term best efforts and a short term mandatory, but what what we found is that it's actually the the, the margin um, actually contracted during that period of time. So more investors, uh, I, I think it's a function of getting that getting that production in the door more than it is to, to, to grab that additional margin because of the volatility. I think more people were fighting for production, which led to a, a contraction in, you know, the, that, that spread between best effort and mandatory. So, um, you know, looking at it from a, from the investor standpoint, I think that they were probably just trying to get more production coming through the doors to make sure that they could offset, um, you know, offset that, that margin component. Makes sense. And then from a secondary perspective, would do you have any advice or, re or, or recommendations you would make to a secondary person um, as they're pricing out their loans and, and realizing they're in this type of market that that they are facing in that first quarter? I think the biggest thing from, from my perspective is just diligence on uh, updating data, right? Uh, I think if, uh, if, uh, if we know that a loan's expired, uh, or a loan's not going to make it through, we'd, wa we'd rather, you know, cancel that loan, drop it out of the hedge and not incur the additional hedge cost for that loan. So, you know, making sure your, your secondary department is scrubbing the data, updating the data points uh, when, when it happens. And I mean, that, that's actually more proactively, they need to be reaching out to their salespeople and to their loan officers and saying, hey, you guys need to let me know if this, these loans are going to make it through, right? I don't want loans sitting on my, sitting on my hedge for, you know, 15, 30 days if I don't need to be hedging them. So, so there's that piece of it. Yeah. You know, Marty, maybe just something to add in real quickly is that um, really kind of how the MSR side has helped out on this is we've had a number of conversations with clients complaining about the, the point that, that Andrew's making, uh, the tighter margins and lower margins and, 
kind of the same question as always, how can somebody go that low and, and get the business? One of the things we've helped them do is identify what their true MSR values are. And so that's really helped them in, in fine tuning their pricing. And I know we have a joint project with the hedging side uh, on a product we call EBX, uh, best execution that includes retained release and um, being, able to show, uh, being able to show clients the MSR value while they're putting their pricing together is, is something that's really been helpful. So just a thought there. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, a little bit back to Andrew's point, we talk about data hygiene all the time in the firm. It's kind of a thing that we, we beat the drum on, but um, making sure that your loan is in the right status and it's, it's a real loan and, and all of the things that go along with it, even how you book it on the accounting side, all of that really matters and can affect um, your results pretty drastically. Well, it's funny you say that, Andrew and Mark, because yesterday, yesterday we were actually on a call with a client walking through some some hedge stuff, some some hedge reports and how to book it. She, the, the the client had had her own process forever, and we we came in and kind of changed it the the audit period. And you know, I was like, well, just just let's look at the MCT reports. Let's go through it. And she's like, well, yeah, but in the past I've gone through the MCT reports and we found errors in them. And I was like, wait if there's errors in the MCT report, it's the errors because data is coming over wrong. It's like, they're, they're, you know, it's because you haven't refreshed data, you haven't done stuff like that. There's, and I think a lot of times, you know, especially on the accounting side, they think, oh, these reports are, you know, it, you know, it, it, MCC said this, so this is what it is, but doesn't realize, hey, it's, it's your data coming through. It's, it's, you know, that's what, it, that's what's feeding everything here. And if you haven't cleaned that up or, you know, whatnot, it can cause big issues and swings from an accounting perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm actually glad you led right into that question, Andrew. So um, it was good. Hey, we do have a question. We had a question on, um, you, you know, said, how do you think the choppiness of the market affected loan valuations? We renegotiated many locks that may have not have qualified had they inquired a day later or a day earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, renegotiations are kind of something that are, are, are needed in order to um, kind of preserve the profitability of the, of the production, right? Because it, essentially, if you're, if you're not renegotiating the production, then essentially it could be walking out the door. And usually, you know, in terms of renegotiation, you know, that could be points uh, walking out the door, right? So it, it, the, the, the choppiness of the market, you know, in terms of, you know, I think we saw a bounce from the lows in mid-March, um, to, to kind of, you know, to where we're kind of currently trading at in, in the 101 area. So, so that kind of, your loan is gaining profitability and in order to, you know, continue to, to keep that profitability in the open pipeline, that's when you have to renegotiate it. But it really is, you know, we've put out, you know, put, <laughs> put out a couple of papers on this and it's the way that I view it is more of an art than it is a, a science. You know, you could have a document kind of putting it all together and saying, Hey, this is how we look at it. This is what needs to be met in order to, you know, in order to, to do a renegotiation at the end of the day, it really is loss mitigation. Cause what you're trying to do is you're trying to retain the value of that loan because you have the offsetting side of it, which is the hedge. So of course, you know, we're, we're dropping the pull through down uh, for loans that experience a market rally to kind of offset some of that. But still at the end of the day, you know, you're still having a hedge that's uh, accounted for on for that loan. So if that loan goes from, you know, from a, a three and a half percent note rate down to a three percent note rate um, because of the market rally, you know, that's essentially you lost a, you know, 50 basis point in rate uh, on, on that loan. So Better to keep it in the better to keep it in house and to have it walk away because you'd rather make you know two thousand dollars than uh, <laughs> than not make two thousand um, dollars, right? So uh, I think it's kind of you know trying to figure out the right way to to, to manage that with your uh, originators um, and and your kind of your LOs. It's it's a it is more like I said more of a art than it is a science and every company is different, right? Some companies will do a 50, 50 split. Some companies will, you know, just give everything to the, to the originator in terms of kind of keeping them happy. Um, so, so it really is just kind of based on how the business is kind of structured and um, you know, the right way to look at it is kind of based off of that. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Mark, one, one question I did want to cover before we moved on on then is just this this one on, uh, I think we kind of started to touch on it, and I don't think we ever went back to it. It's just on the, the new, you know, FHFA guidance and kind of how that's affected everything and whether it's affected the, how it's affected the pipeline, if it's affected the margin, what, like kind of just, just how all that, I mean, I think that's been a hot topic in the, I mean, we're doing a whole panel at the TMBA conference on this. And so just, just wanted to know kind of how it, you know, how you see it affecting everything. Andrew. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think um, uh, it's actually interesting. I was talking to a counterpart over here at MCT, Justin Grant, and uh, he was seeing some client pipelines have a, you know, anywhere from a, a 20 to 30 basis point drop on the aggregate uh, because of the, because of the non-owners and the, and the seconds. So, um, you know, this goes to kind of what we were talking about earlier with the different execution outlets. You know, if, if you're able to sell it to, to Fannie or and Freddie and stay within, you know, your seven or 6% cap, you know, whatever they determine that to be at the end of the day, um, then that's going to be your most profitable uh, uh, path. But for a lot of our guys who had, you know, 15, 20% of non-owners in their open pipeline and they weren't retaining a lot of it, like, so they essentially had to max out their uh, agency execution at 7%. And then the rest of it, they ended up selling at a, at a, at a detriment, like anywhere. Uh, I saw some clients executing, you know, three or four points back off their agency execution to manage that, you know, manage that 7%. So it, it really did come as a, as a hit. And, you know, I, I think looking at the future, I think we're going to be able to, to give a, a, a private securitization, uh, we'll be able to give a private securitization price for those non-owners, but I think that was a, a huge impact to profitability um, for, you know, for, for actually it's going to be Q1 and Q2, truthfully. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. We have, we have a couple other questions that came in that are really, really good. And, and ones that we get often, Dustin, you want me to read that or you, you want to read it? Um, Go for it. I, yeah, okay. whatever. So we got, we got questions. So they get the reason uh, behind the change, but how do we explain it to the CFO, uh, senior management, on why there's such a gap between the projections and the fair value plus GOS versus the hedge performance, gain on sale, obviously, versus the hedge performance, uh, the intermix of all these concepts. So how to highlight the hedge, that the hedge is working fine despite the quarterly income variations. Um, I'll talk through that a little bit, um, and then and then you guys can take it from there, I think. You know, explaining the CFO and senior management um, and owners is always a big challenge uh, when you see variances that are different than what you projected. Um, I, I think I think you start with one one is that you know we're this business is not without risk. Um, interest rate risk is a real thing, um, and that's why you hedge, and that's why. Um, a lot of this, these heads positions were in the money when your loans were out of the money. And if, if you were properly hedged or close to properly hedged, you, your experience of that potential loss was, was mitigated. And that's why you hedge. When you, and and to, to understand that, that uh, the idea of, of hedging your pipeline isn't that you're making money on your hedge, it's you're, you're, uh, mitig you're, you're limiting any kind of interest rate risk by being in a hedge position to kind of lock in your 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 gain on sale that you potentially were going to have or your what your target gain was going to be. So I think understanding first of all why you're hedging is 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 an important piece of that. Um, being able to track it back to where you can show the money actually went the other direction when you're set out of your your uh, your trades. Um, and then um, and then and then managing for that. But there's not a perfect answer to that question. In, in my experience, um, it's it's a difficult thing, um, but it's the reality of mortgage banking uh, to a great extent. Um, Dustin and, and you guys have anything to add? I, I know when I owned a mortgage bank, it was one of my biggest frustrations, right? Like we, we <laughs> have, I thought I was pretty good at nailing this stuff. Of course, this was a hundred thousand years ago when I was much younger and had um, didn't have gray hair. So, um, and, and, but the fluctuations maybe gave me gray hair and decided to get out of that side of the business. But, um, but, but I, I think, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, but go ahead. I'll let you guys follow up on that. 
No, I mean, I think, Andrew, if you have any thoughts, I mean, that's something we get all the time. And I mean, when they get into like, well, how, how do we, how can we tell that this hedge is working on this loan? I mean, you know, you know I mean, wait, wait, I mean, I, I know the generic answer, but what, what would you, what would you say there? I mean, you, you get know. some loan level covers there, can't you, Andrew? Come on, yeah, man. exactly. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it, it, I mean, it, it's a good, good question. And it's something that we, you know, try to try to address with our client base in terms of like, Hey, it's, you know, looking at it on the loan level is, is difficult to do, right? Because you're not, you're not putting a hedge on for a $300,000 loan. You're putting a hedge on for, you know, 5 million in new production on the day. Right. Yeah, so right. so your, it, your whole, it, your whole pipeline, if you, if you put a trade on every single loan, you would lock in a loss, right? Because your trade costs would be ridiculous. So. Exactly. You'd have yeah, a huge, huge trade costs. So, you know, trying to trying to look at it from an aggregate, looking at it, you know, retroactively, I think, you know, we have a loan level hedge cost uh, report that we provide to, you know, clients that kind of breaks it down. There's a couple of assumptions that we have to make in order to to, to do that report. So it's not perfect. But um, I, I think, you know, just just looking at it from. Uh, I guess from a, a fair value standpoint, um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're working on some additional reporting to kind of track, um, you know, kind of the profitability to do it. So you could do a profitability walk and say, hey, you know, my loans gained this much value, my hedge lost this much value, my derivative asset, you know, changed from, you know, 80% of the open pipeline. Now it's only 70% of the open pipeline. So now I have an additional, you know, uh, call it call it five or ten percent in uh, in closed production, which is valued over par as opposed to being valued over another instance. So, so we're working on all those. Um, we're working on providing that you know report to you know to our clients in terms of being able to see how the profitability changes. But it is it's a hard question to answer, right? It's it's not it's not cut and dry. Um, you know, we could show you kind of how it all how all the profitability moves, but um, I, I think, you know, getting down to uh, getting down to like, hey, did this loan, did I make money on this loan compared to my hedge? That's that's a hard that's a hard question to answer. Yeah. So, so let's take on that next one on the wholesale market. And then we got to switch over to MSR yeah. here pretty quick. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So let's so we answer these real quick, Andrew. And I think these are geared just towards you. And then we'll jump to you, David. Um, so it says in the wholesale market, it appears that lenders are choosing to pass on the entire gain on sale to the brokers and are funding operations by either dipping into retained earnings from prior production, current servicing income, or prior production. How long can this strategy continue? And are there any lenders making money on actual cash to realize? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that, Andrew? Or, uh -huh. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point because uh, what, we've, what we've found is that there's a lot of competitiveness, in, uh, especially in the aggregator space, which I think kind of feeds into the wholesale market that uh, we're talking about. Um, in, in, the the reason that we've seen kind of aggregated pricing get aggressive on just the plain vanilla stuff is uh, to to kind of to to offset their non owner uh, population of production with the agencies. So you know some some aggregators out there are pricing through their execution in order to get that volume in, so they can reduce their de minimis. So like so they can manage that seven percent or six percent tolerance, whatever it is. Um, you know, whatever it ends up being with Fannie and Freddie. So they're just trying to get production in the door to offset that. So that's why we've seen some aggressive pricing in the, in the aggregator space. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And last question for you, Andrew, just let's, I think this will be an easy one for you to cover and then we can jump on um, from the sell off or sell offs earlier this year and having the market recover a bit. Have you seen aggregators pad their margins? You know, they've seen some aggregators fall out of the strongest competitive positions, which are affecting their, you know, open pipelines. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's kind of a, a mixed bag there. You know, we've seen some investors um, come out with really aggressive pricing uh, in terms of kind of trying to trying to manage that um, production uh, for the non-owners. But we've all we've also seen the flip side of it, to where you know, talking to you know one of the larger aggregators, their their overall win percentage is down in the single digits. Um, and, and they're asking us where it's all going. And the fact of the matter is a lot of our guys that are agency sellers are, you know, selling this stuff, you know, selling the production to Fannie Mae. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, that's probably where some of the aggregators uh, are, are going with it. They're, they're kind of reducing 
their footprint in order to manage the the pipeline that they have uh, in terms of you know non owners and seconds and kind of making sure they have the capacity to funnel that into the appropriate um, into the appropriate agency delivery. Um, you know, it, some of these guys, some of the aggregators don't have, uh, or, you know, we haven't heard that they're doing, uh, or they're looking to do private label securitizations. So uh, for those investors that are kind of still, you know, still kind of holding off on the private label side, I could see them definitely, you know, kind of trying to trying to reduce their footprint. Um, and so, so increasing their margin, but for some of the other aggregators out there, um, you know, I know three that three specifically that I've talked to, they're they're kind of working on a PLS deal right now, and that should be you know sometime in July or August. So with that, I think we're we're going to see some investors. I think we're going to see a disparity. I think we're going to see some investors start getting more aggressive and start you know increasing their footprint, and then I think we're also going to see other investors you know try to you know increase their margin and reduce their footprint. So I think it is kind of a, a mixed bag based off of the kind of just each investor's appetite. So um, that's where I think from the secondary side, just kind of taking a step back is that's where it's important to, to make sure that you're, you know, you, you have a, a good set of investors that you're, you're, you're comfortable delivering to. Um, if you only have a, a small set of investors, then you're, poten you're limiting your potential at that point in time. So. Okay. Great. And Andrew, when, I, when we come to the end, maybe I'm going to have you come back and talk about maybe current market conditions, what you're seeing out there from, from um, pipelines and margins. But um, so, so I'm also going to hold the people who want to wait for that. They'll have to stay on the call. No, I'm just kidding. But we'll <laughs> come back to that. Um, uh, let, let's switch over to David. So David, um, thanks for sitting here quite through that. We, we want to talk some MSR. So Maybe you can talk to us a little, what's happening with retain release um, and the decisions around that and what's changed from, from last year to what's going on this year from a high level. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of things parallel uh, what Andrew had to say. So just to kind of pick up on that, obviously last year about this, well, in March, you know, the decisions went from, um, you know, 70, 80% uh, release to aggregators to retaining everything. So you had, lots of smaller originators uh, who were used to portfolios of two, three hundred million dollars, see that portfolio jump to over a billion, two billion, uh, because it just the execution just made sense to hold on to it. Now, as the year has gone on, we've started to see the pricing differences between retained and released really tighten. And really, since about March, we've kind of seen the aggregators really come on strong and the for the first time in the year, the percentage of, of released business started to exceed the, uh, the retained business. So really about the last three months, we're watching the uh, you know, aggregator pricing really come back strongly across the board. So in terms of a retained release decision, it's interesting, our clients are really looking at a number of factors because for some of them, it's, it's uh, the last year has really changed their strategy and they've decided to become someone who wants to build a portfolio. So now, even though maybe best execution doesn't really send the loan to uh, the release, the retained side, they're, they're looking at factors that would still help them retain more loans and we're kind of helping them pick the best loans to keep. So that's an interesting thing as well. And then obviously others are just, you know, they're doing best X straight up and whatever gets them the best dollars in their pocket today is, is what they're going with. So it's, it's the, the market's kind of changed over some time in the retained release side. So does that yeah. answer your question? No, that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, how about the bulk MSR sale market? Um, I know it's been pretty active. Um, we, we've heard, we've, we've seen um, some of it happen, but maybe you can explain a little bit why that's going on and, and what's happening with that. Sure. And I, and I think Andrew gave a lot of reasons for this as well. So, um, but I'll give you a little bit of history and then kind of tell you where we're at. So uh, obviously last year at this time, uh, March, April, you know, um, and multiples were down to zero. So we were just, and that's why everybody was retaining. So slowly over the year that they, they've come back and we really started to see the bulk market open up in fourth quarter of last year. And, you know, conventional business starting to get into the 
the high threes. And then in the first quarter, we, we saw it very active and started to see things cross over in the fours. And, and now we're seeing things between four and four and a half multiples for, the con, for conventional business. Government's been a little slower to come back somewhere between two and three along the same kind of growth pattern. But we're seeing a growth in people wanting government business actually. And it's that um, the idea that those uh, that the higher interest rates that might be on the government loans are, are still ones that are going to stick and people that know how to service government loans really want those. So uh, what we've watched is activity increase from the fourth quarter into, you know, the, through the second quarter. And we actually see that uh, that trend continuing for and this is where the crossover is a lot of the reasons that Andrew gave. You know, so people that are not used to retaining, you know, there's less less volume, you know, um, it's been higher rates, you know, lower production, uh, revenues drop some. So there are people that are looking at selling their book because it's an opportunistic thing to do at the moment or selling a portion of it uh, to help with revenue. So, um, and there's certainly no loss of buyers out there. So we see a, a, a large, large field of buyers and the, the deals that we're sending out for bid or have getting, gotten really a lot of attention. And some have, you know, normally it's about 90 to 120 days to close a deal. We've had deals close in less than 30 because wow. of the uh, appetite or the, uh, I wouldn't call it anxiety, uh, just how anxious people were to, to book a deal. And, you know, and they saw something they liked and they just grabbed it up. So. Is that the same with the flow, like the flow market? Is that is that kind of come back now too? Or is, is it like, like, I mean, are y'all still... I mean, is that, how's that doing right now, I guess? Well, I, I guess I'd equate that to, uh, you know, S&P or cash window for Fannie Mae or the co-issue side. I, probably Andrew could speak to that better than I could, but we certainly see that very strong. I don't know, Andrew, okay. do you have any comments on that? Back on mute. On uh, mute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love it. That's, that's, uh, the, for... <laughs> phrase, that's the phrase of Zoom for the last two years, right? <laughs> Uh, no, I was sorry. I was just about to say, yeah, from, from a servicing marketplace perspective, we're definitely seeing uh, some, some decent malts uh, for flow deals. Uh, so, so Dustin, to, to your kind of uh, question there is if the client is, you know, getting those relationships requested with Fannie Mae and, you know, using that servicing marketplace outlet, then, you know, we're, we're seeing some, um, we are seeing some decent, uh, decent, volume go that way however the majority of guys that are delivering to to fanny and um you know fanny and freddie are retaining that and, and trying to build their you know build that book so um you know it's i think it's a little skewed in terms of you know depending on if you're uh, trying to build your book of servicing or if you're trying to you know sell released and not looking to build your book of servicing so so david i, I asked you a question i get um often uh it's is, is there like a sweet spot on a si deal size or uh, um kind of a a minimum deal size that 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 you're seeing in, in the marketplace yeah there, you know there's um on the msr side there's there's a lot of different tranches in terms of when, when you put put packages together i'd say it's it's hard to get a good number on a package less than 500 million I mean, there's certainly people looking to buy 250 and 500 million, but typically it's harder to get like good value for that. Normally where we see the premium kind of pricing is somewhere between a billion and, and 5 billion, somewhere in that range um, is, is where kind of we've seen a sweet spot. And over that you've got, those become typically deals that are negotiated between two companies who know each other and want to do business. And certainly we've seen some large deals hit the market so, um, but typically our, our clientele ranges between that, you know, one to 10 billion range. And um, we, we usually always uh, advise them to try to be at least a billion if they can. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that we've seen it. Go ahead, Dustin. So Mark, it's probably more of a question for you, for you that, that plays into this. So when you're, you know, when, when clients are looking to do sales and stuff like that, you know, one of the factors they can take into account is capital gains treatment. I mean, they, you know, at least it, there's arguments that at least a portion and a significant portion of that can be treated as capital gains if they've held it, you know, over a year, you know, there's whispering about capital gains going away and, and whatnot. So, so, so what are your, what are your thoughts on that? What, you know, how does it affect, you know, what the, the decision of when to sell, that kind of thing. I mean, if you want to touch just briefly on that, that'd be probably a good thing to cover. 
sure and i always say you know going bottom of my screen is this is not tax advice so don't hold me to this but um i i you know it's we we don't know what's going to happen right there's talk um there's talk of making retroactive tax decisions um uh, what we do know is what the current law is and um based on on the current law there's there's tax advantages of selling this asset um and not having to pay ordinary income tax on that, on that number. Um, but I think what I advise clients on just in general is the business decision is what should drive whether or not you sell it or keep it, not necessarily the tax situ um, ramifications of it. Um, that taxes are important and they certainly are part of the decision. Um, but if you have a, a valuable portfolio that's throwing off cash and it fits into your overall business model, you wouldn't just sell it just because the tax law might change. So um, it, it, it's a factor that should be considered. It should be looked at. Um, there's a lot of pushback on, on getting rid of capital gains. Um, and you know, we, I, I don't know necessarily what's going to happen with that. Um, yeah, Mark, just to give our, you some insight from our side the uh you're, you're exactly right um people are looking at that and trying to measure that out but we are seeing some more deals hit the market due to that yeah just concern you know they yeah. they don't know what's going to happen and they i guess a bird in the hands better than you know two in the bush to them so i think that's right it's driving a few deals that we're seeing but your advice is spot on so i think yeah. that's great yeah i mean it's it's definitely a factor it's not the only factor to consider right. um you know but, uh, yeah. you know, they, I think that that always goes into any business decision as it relates to tax. Um, but you're right. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. You know what the current law is. We hope it doesn't, they don't go in and make, make it retroactive, which they have done in the past. I mean, there's, the, the IRS has come in and passed laws and made it retroactive to um, periods that have passed. They usually, there's usually things we can do about that, but, you know, there's, um, it's definitely part of the consideration. What else do you have there, Dustin? Um, so I, I guess probably the last, you, you know, the last question is just on the MSR side. We talked a little bit on the cash window. Um, um, I, I guess, you know, just touch a little bit more on that. Just, just, just David is, is you know, how is, how is this limited cash window, um, and in, in, in ramping up to doing your full full mortgage backed security delivery, how, how is that affecting things? Like, what, what are you seeing out there? What, what's what's the change in strategy? That kind of thing. Yeah, so that when you're, uh, it really depends on the size of the originator. But if you're in that kind of three to six billion dollar origination category, and you're looking at being limited to you know 1.5 billion for each GSE, then you've really got to seriously start to consider you know whether you need to open up an MBS strategy. And I'm sure Andrew and those guys are talking about that too. But from the servicing side, there's a lot of changes that that hits that. You know, you're going to go from a cash window of you know kind of an actual actual standpoint where there's no remittance exposure, and then you're going to you know open up a MBS strategy where you're going to schedule schedule, then you're, you're you definitely have cash exposure based on whether the bar is making their payments or not. So we are advising a lot of clients in that regard. We are seeing that come up. And I think it has a lot to do with whether or not the originator feels like they're going to run up against that, you know, that um, barrier of, you know, 1.5 billion per, per GSE. I don't and know so to elaborate to that on that actual, the actual schedule, schedule to topic you're talking about, because I mean, that, that is a question that comes up some just, just yep. to make sure I'm clear and that the audience is clear, you, you know, when they move to schedule to schedule, you, you know, they're, they're responsible if a borrower doesn't make a payment, they're still responsible for that payment pretty much, right? The, the lender. Yeah, they're so responsible they have to for the principal and interest to the, yes, absolutely. Got it. So they have to advance that cash. So they'll have a servicing advance and they have to advance it out and then you right. know work on collecting it and and, and whatnot. So it's a, it could be a cash drain, I guess, is what we're talking about. Well, you just have, it's something that you, um, you just have to do cash flow analysis, right? I mean, and, and for mortgage bankers, it's particularly an issue that they really need to take a look at because, Cash flow is typically their, their livelihood, so they really need to take a close look. I mean, and then they also have a pay cycle to deal with. It's a different pay cycle, so you're looking at 55 days for that pay cycle. So there is some float that can be had to offset, but um, 
you know, the, if, if the borrower's not making their payments, then they're certainly responsible for the payment. Got it. That's good. I want to encourage everybody on the call to go ahead and make sure you ask some questions as we're getting close to the end here and make sure we don't have any burning questions we haven't answered. Um, and, and Mark, real, real quick, just to touch on the um, the, the co-issue piece of the uh, of the cash window execution, you're you're still able, you know, you'll you'll still be able to deliver MBS. Like if you if you are, you know, outside of that cash window cap, you you are still going to be able to have a co-issue buyer for your mortgage-backed security that you're creating. So it doesn't, you know, if, if you if you do want to sell it released um, and you are having to do MBS, uh, you still have that, you still have that option, right? So, so it's, it doesn't take, it doesn't take the co-issue piece completely away, uh, but it does increase the, uh, the complexity of your execution uh, you know, when you're running the best X's or when you're creating your pools. So. Cool. We had a couple of questions come in. Um, what are you seeing on the specific pool size of the market? Um, low, low loan balance, et cetera. What are you guys seeing? Um, so in terms of, uh, I mean, I, I think, <laughs> Um, there's a lot of different ways I could yeah. take this question. So, uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think yeah. MBS, like creating, you know, uh, MBS, you have your pool minimum of a 1 million, um, you know, with the cash window, it's all, it's straight okay. peer delivery, um, you know, to, to the cash window, no, doesn't need a, a, a minimum, but in terms of getting additional pickup, um, outside of what you're seeing from the Fannie cash window, uh, I think you're probably going to want to get, try to aggregate some volume. I don't know if the sweet spot is, uh, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, you know, it's kind of hard to determine what that, what that sweet spot is, but what we've heard from a lot of different, uh, dealers and, and guys that are doing MBS right now is that, you know, the, the prepay speed of those pools is kind of going to be more what dictates the price of the of the pool so um yeah sorry there's a there's a lot there's a lot that there's we can go into with that and, but yeah uh, just kind of an overview right right and i i you know hopefully i read it okay and, and got that um anything else uh anything else you guys want to share david and andrew i know we want to circle back on the current market conditions uh what we're seeing from volumes and margins um but any, anything you want to add david just from the msr market in general or um yeah i think i think two points just kind of what we're watching in the marketplace i'd say first and foremost what we're watching from a practicality standpoint is people uh valuing their books more often than they used to um so we're seeing a minimum of people valuing their books at least once a quarter and a good 30 mm, percent now of our customers are valuing on a monthly basis. So um, it, it, something to think about, particularly when you start to look at your warehouse lines and your investors, there's a number of people now that really want to check the value of your book more often than they used to uh, just from a day-to-day -day standpoint. So something you probably see as well too on your oh, side. Yeah. So. yeah, on our audit side, our audit team are looking for those valuations on a fairly, at least quarterly basis, um, especially if they have a substantial portfolio. Yeah. So we're seeing- Yeah, I mean, that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, if they have a big portfolio, I mean, you, you know, they're technically required to report on GAAP and GAAP would be marking that, you know, to, to you know, fair value, I think in the realistic sense of it, though, if your portfolio is not very significant, you know, you probably can get away with doing it quarterly or that's biannually right. or that's even right. annually, depending on how big yeah. it is. But it's, you know, if you've got something substantial, you should be valuing it every, you know, every month or every quarter for your, you know, your your warehouse banks and your investors and all that kind of thing. So, and and I think that's a place where you guys could particularly be helpful and certainly pull us in. We can help as well too. I think that one of the fundamentals in the market right now is you have people that are not used to having large portfolios now have, you know, billion, two billion, three billion, five billion dollar portfolios when they had less than a billion before. And, you know, they're they're really adept at being an originations manager, a best execution manager, but they're not really asset managers. Kind of Dustin, to your comment a little earlier about having to tell people the right, you know, ledger to put it on. 
um, we're seeing those fundamentals occur, you know, really just with how to manage the book. So um, that's something, you know, fundamentally to think about as you guys look for to give advice as well, too. Yeah, yeah it, it's funny you say that as, as people continue to grow this asset there, we run into, you know, subservice oversight issues and right. lots of other compliance related issues right. that um, that sneak up on our clients yeah. because they're oh, not. Yeah. You know, know. They're, they're like, I just want to build this portfolio and there's right. all kinds of things that come along yeah. with it. Um, obviously, we're here to help support that. And and yeah. um, and also MCT, I know you, you do a lot with um, with helping with the valuations and other things. And so we appreciate that. Yeah, we had we had someone the other day just ask us, can you tell me where my cash flow is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we can't. We can show you. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's it's a fun, it's really a really a fundamental. And then the last point I'll make is we touched on a little earlier, but it's really come up a bunch with um, tightening margins. People are trying to find ways to sharpen their pencil and give a price with a, a good price, without, you know, you know, still being able to keep something in their pocket. And as Andrew's saying, you know, uh, like win the loan and not what we've been able to, you know, what uh, we've where we've helped is being able to give people a customized MSR value instead of using standardized grids from the GSEs or a large aggregator kind of to throw into their pricing by, by given the real value of what their loans are worth, it's, it, they've, been, they've been able to see some pickup. So obviously there's a lot of factors that go into pricing, but it's just one where they can kind of sharpen their pencil a little bit more. Well, it's funny, David, your cash flow comment. Like I, I don't think I've ever done as many abbreviated cash flow things in the last or in, in April and May than I've ever done in my entire career. I mean, everybody's asking, well, wait, wait, what, what is this like? Why, why, why is this happening? Where's my cash? I made this much money, but where's my cash? And so you have to like show them the change in values. You have to do all that. So it's been a, I mean, it's, it, it's been Actually, definitely. We had, we had a lot go the other way. Like, why do I have all this cash, but it shows exactly. it make any money. Yeah. That's really what yeah. happened, yeah. right? Cause you had right. Both side, yeah. huge fair yeah. value numbers at the end of the year. But all that cash came in in the Q1 of 2021, but the profit was not where yeah. they expected right. it to be. Yeah, yeah to, to, to your point, Mark, it was actually, where's my income? That where's was my question. Income? Where's, right. where's my income? God. My cash if yeah. my income's right, why is where's yeah. why do I have cash? Like, uh, yeah. the cash? Yeah. Which is obviously, the, the, we'd rather have that problem, generally speaking. But um, yeah, um, great. So, I guess we're kind of coming up to the end. I always want to respect people's time. Maybe real quick, um, give us a, a current current market, like what we're seeing for pipelines um, and, and kind of margins. And then if, if you want to be a forecaster, um, uh, you can tell us what's happening. But uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I think, you know, in terms of pipelines, we've definitely, you know, seen it trail off since uh, going back to, I think, February, like beginning of February is kind of when, when we saw pipelines kind of peak out. Um, and then, you know, seeing it kind of like drop off, we saw it drop off pretty, pretty good, pretty substantially, you know, in February, but then it's kind of, you know, we're still seeing a downward trend in overall production and, uh, you know, it's expected with the upward trend in rates. Uh, I don't think that's gonna, uh, I don't think it's gonna go away, especially with the Fed, you know, talking about backing out of buying uh, mortgage backed securities. So I think, you know, the risk is to, you know, rates, rates increasing here in the near future. So uh, I think we're, we are kind of range bound. Um, but that, that could all change based off of uh, a Fed announcement or, you know, some stimulus package that comes out. So it, it's kind of de dependent on um, economic conditions, but I, I think, you know, uh, we're, we're currently kind of range bound, but I, I think if we get any more inklings of a kind of, of a tapering uh, of bond purchases, then we'll, we'll see it kind of break out of that range and rates kind of continue higher. Fantastic. Um, we appreciate that. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for for joining the call. We will have the recording will be sent out to to all, everybody who participated or whoever whoever joined us. Um, there'll be a link to it, which will be hosted on our, our website. So, um, if you guys have any follow up questions or want to find out um, anything more and reach out to our our friends at MCT or us, please feel free to do so. Um, we want to make sure that we're continue to give you guys support. We know this industry isn't simple and we were here to, we're here to help you out. So um, anything else you guys want to add? 
No, just thanks for the opportunity. It's uh, I, I like having discussions like this. It's really nice. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. We appreciate it. Was it was super valuable and we appreciate your time. It was yeah, and the relationship. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll close with is if anybody has any ideas for topics, we, we try to do these bi-monthly. So definitely send over an email or we're glad to jump on and put other topics on the, on the, on the, in the docket. So, um, so thank you yep. both. And thank you for joining guys. Yep. See y'all. Take care. Take care guys. Bye-bye. Thanks guys.